Welcome back to the Money Focus Podcast. I'm your host, Moses the Mentor. And in this episode, I'm excited to welcome Sita Lash. She's the innovative founder, inventor, and CEO of the Puff Cuff. She transformed a personal hair care challenge into a thriving business that caters to those with thick, textured hair. She's here to share her entrepreneurial journey, the inspiration behind her invention, and how she's empowering others with her vision. So let's dive into her transformative journey. Let's go. The first thing I always ask my guests to do is to really walk us through your career journey, professional journey, and just ultimately how you started your business. So the floor is yours. The career journey, interesting. So I never thought to be completely 100%, 200% transparent. I never thought I was going to end up in this space. Um, I am a graphic designer by career. And that's what I thought I was going to be. I always worked as a consultant or a freelancer because I didn't like the whole corporate, you know, atmosphere as well as the um, politics and all the stuff that goes in with it. So I was after I think my first job that I had, my first full time job after college, which has been a while, a long time ago, I would be working next to freelancers or consultants doing the same exact job that they were doing for the company, but they got to come in, do what they do, and then leave and was being paid like three times the amount that I was being paid. I don't like being stagnant. I like change. I like meeting new people, new opportunities. So it was like, I think I'm going to be a consultant. And the fact that I was a graphic designer allowed me to do that. So I didn't have to be in one place working for one industry I could go all over. That actually led me to starting the Puff Cuff, which is the product that I invented. I, at the time, was freelancing for a uh, community college right outside of Chicago. And it would just happen to be the same time that I was getting my hair chemically straightened for years, for years. And like I had I think I got my first relaxer when I was 10, because at that point it was like the rite of passage for young girls to get their hair relaxed and stop going from getting hot comb to get, you know, hot comb and braids to getting your hair relaxed. So I had not actually seen my natural hair since I was maybe four or five years old, had no idea how to take care of it, all, all the above. So but at that time, I happened to go longer between touch-ups because I would get my hair relaxed every four to six weeks. And I literally just couldn't get into the beautician's chair. So I went longer between touch-ups. And when I did that, all of what I thought was eczema that I had been suffering with from for years just literally just disappeared. It all just went away. And I really thought wow, this, this is my body telling me that I need to stop with these chemicals because I had been, you know, the, 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 the dermatitis and the dandruff and the scaling, the itch, all of that, for it to just go away by itself. And I had been using all types of medications and everything else. It was like, okay, I'm not going back to this. But this was in like early 2000s. So there was no curly hair movement. There was no Google like it is, no social media, all of that. So, and it was just me growing out my natural hair and I didn't know what to do with it or how to style it, how to take care of it, anything. And I couldn't go to my aunties, mom, grandma, none of them because they all were relaxing and straightening their hair. So... The way that I mentioned, like I said, I was graphic designer, freelancing in higher education um, in the North. So I was the only black woman in the department and the only black woman in the building. So you know how black women, we can change up our hair and everything. So it's always like a source of uh, a source of uh, interest for everyone just like oh what you know how to see to have her hair today you all amaze me how you can do such different stuff with your hair but when i was growing it out natural i was like okay i don't want the attention this is not a life-changing event even though it was life-changing i just want to feel comfortable in my own skin and the way 
that, and I didn't want my hair to lead the conversations. So the way that I felt comfortable was to wear my hair in a style like this. But like I said, there was, there was no influence that I could lean into to help me figure out how to style it. At that time, when I went to go look for tools or anything that would help me style it the way this is, I couldn't find anything. So I had to use a boot size shoestring and tie it around my neck, then pull it up and cinch my hair up <laughs> and wrap it around and just hope that it would stay. Or I would have to take one of those supposedly ouchless headbands, pull it over my head, wrap it twice, roll it up to try and see if I could get all of my hair to stay up. And no matter what I used, I would have a blazing headache by the end of the day. The, the relief and the, the exhale that my body did from stop using, from not using the chemicals on a regular basis, it was so great. I wasn't going to go back, but I needed to be able to style my hair in a way that I felt comfortable looking at myself as well as trying to embrace this hair that I had not ever been used to. And I couldn't find anything. So I was using those tools that weren't meant to be used with hair. And I was searching all over the internet and in store trying to find a tool that kind of made sense in my mind that should work for my hair, but the tool would not bind my hair. It would just hold my hair in place, if that makes sense. I had the idea of this little clamp. I, no, I got the idea from a clamp, a little clamp that my mother and grandmother used to have. And it was, it was about this big, maybe about this big, but it had teeth all the way through. And my whole thought was I needed something on a much larger scale and I didn't want the teeth because any, anything like teeth like this, the only thing that's getting through this stuff is, is straight hair. So I'm like, right, that ain't going to work. I wanted the teeth to be spaced out and the teeth kind of like only really function to anchor the tool or the clip in place and to work with like kind of like work like fingers as if you were holding your hair up with your fingers. So I was at the right place at the right time being working at that junior college. I had the idea in my head, since I'm a graphic designer, I could get it out of my head onto paper so I could get it, you know, a 2D version of it. But I knew I had to get some type of working physical prototype. But since I was at the college, I was able to work like catalog stock is what I said it, say it, how I describe it, because this was actually when all the classes were in a book and you had to, you know, to open up the catalog, there was no, nothing was online. So I had to, I went and I catalog stocked all of the engineering professors and inner office mailed them. You probably are too, even know to, too young to even know what inner office mail is. No, that's with the uh, manila envelope and you got to put your name on it and kind of cycle it through the office. Yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, I'm not that young. <laughs> inner office mail and then there's inner office, inner office email. I just did that until somebody would meet with me for lunch to help me bring it to life. And that's what happened. That's how Puff Cuff came to be. So with you being a graphic designer, I'm sure creating the 2D version was pretty much nothing for you because, you know, you can do that in your sleep. But walk us through what all it took to actually produce a full prototype of your product. I knew I needed an engineer of some type. So I thought I needed a CNC, you know, this is totally not my ministry. This is only out of my realm. But he was like, no, you actually need a CAD engineer. And then with that that CAD engineer should be able to take your 2D design, make it three-dimensional, and then you should be able to um, produce a 3D print. So this was like the very, the early onset of 3D printing. I also had a friend of mine who was a carpenter take my idea and carve it out of a piece of wood. So I had my piece of wood, had the 2D drawing, and I got introduced to my CAD engineer, which I, we still have a relationship to this day. And that was, this was like 12 years ago. 
So basically that was it. Cause I don't have the math skills and all of that needed, but I knew that this skill set would be able to help me bridge that gap. And that's what I did. So I met with the CAD engineer and he came up with um, the first 3D prototypes and which is a 3D print, basically. Walk us through some of your initial challenges that you faced when you first started your company. It's still challenges. It ain't <laughs> <It's> still <laughs> challenges. Um, this consumer product game is is no joke, man. Especially when you're the first of your type. Because, and let me answer the first question that you asked. The challenges then were not knowing about building a business, not having anyone to go to that has built a business with a market, built a business that has the same type of target market that I have, um, no money, just no working knowledge of just bringing a product to market, let alone retailing it. So all the above. And also not realizing that at that time that being a black female was going to, because I was born with estrogen, that that was going to be a barrier for a lot of uh, financial backing, period. You know, it just, and it, it's still, it's gotten better, but it's still a very, very big part of the world we live in, the reality that we live in. You know, for someone who wants to be in this type of industry, you know, I'm hoping you can paint the picture of like a full representation of what it's like to, you know, have an idea, develop a product um, in a very competitive industry. So if you can kind of walk us through some of the things that you wish you you knew beforehand, some of the things that you're doing now, uh, that'd be great. My f advice first would be get a mentor that's already in doing what you want to do. There's way more, more of us that are accessible now than it was before. And then you also have to understand, I mean, I had to understand the history of Black personal hair care and the reason why there are so many Korean-owned beauty supplies versus Black-owned beauty supplies. And, and what's the history of the products that are available and, you know, things like that. So I kind of... Now that I've been on this journey, I know the history of some of those big black brands that no longer exist or they're now owned by um, foreign entities. You know what I mean? And the consumable market, when, when I say that, it's the wet products and stuff like that. That's total, even though it's under beauty and personal care, it's really different than the hair accessory or the tool, the tool industry. Um, both of them are billion, billion, billion dollar industries. They're huge corporations, you know? And um, I had no idea how, how much it was going to cost to create a tool. I'm glad I didn't know, actually, in the very beginning, how much the cost was, because I probably would have talked, continued to talk myself out of, um, bringing this product to life. I feel like there was some bliss in my ignorance, you know, but I also feel like I also know that if I had had that mentor earlier in this process, I would be further along in the business. But then there's also, there's also so many things that, you know, have changed in the world that we live in, in terms of even getting your message out, like social media wasn't around when all of those products, you know, all of the, the lusters and the, you know, the, the um, um, what is it? Dark and lovely or something like that. But like even now it's like dark and lovely is not owned by black folks anymore. And it's like, wow. no, Cantu is not a black owned brand. Everybody thinks it is, but it's not. The headquarters is in Luxembourg, Germany. They're owned by a hedge fund and they own a whole bunch of beauty brands, but that's, it's like one of those things to where you really have to understand and know how this game works because no one's telling you. You have to find out and do the research on your own. And once you, you 
you start to know the history and you know who the players are, where they are, what, 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 who's owned by what, then you can kind of start to navigate, okay, this is what this actually means. This is the presence that they actually have. This is who they, this is who they're marketing to, but are they real? And it's like, you understand that as the, as the brand owner, but also trying to get your consumers to not take everything at face value. There is so much history to the personal care industry and how it's sewn into the black culture, especially within the United States, that you really need to know, and you have to tread lightly at the same time, but you really need to know where your products are coming from as well as what's in them. And if they're really for you or not. Well, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, you, you've done a great job of breaking down some of the challenges of being an entrepreneur, especially in the personal care industry. But at some point, some point, um, you were to the point where you had to have known like, hey, I got something here. When did that happen and how did that make you feel? Actually, I had the idea of Puff Cuff back in 2006. I didn't, I found every reason under the sun not to really bring it to life until 2010, 2011. I, you know, I figured I was, I didn't have any business background. I was not going back to college again because I was like, once I got out of undergrad, I felt like a free person. I was never going back. I did not want to take on that expense and every everything else that was less. I was like, I'm not getting an MBA. I don't want to do that. I also figured I wasn't smart enough. I didn't have enough money. There was every reason in the book. But God gave me two life-changing situations where I was able to take care of my 99-year-old grandmother in her last, during her transition phase, where she went from living independently to being and being diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And then um, my father's an only child and um, her doctors were like, you cannot, basically told her you cannot live by yourself anymore. And she was like, I'm not coming to live with your dad. So got to make room in the house for, you, for your grandma. And I was like, I would love to have you come live with me. So she came to live with me. Um, and at that same time, my husband and I were on the adoption uh, waiting list because we wanted to adopt a child because that was another one of my, um, my, I feel like God has, God had put it on me to put down the myth that black people don't adopt black children. So um, that was one of my life goals too. Both of those situations intersected on the same weekend. We had literally been waiting for 18 months to um, receive our third child and actually had decided to take our names off the list because we wanted to be able to give my grandmother that attention. And it was like, this is a big undertaking. So maybe we should just put our, put the adoption on pause until we get a, get our footing with grandma. Well, God chose different and was like, you're the birth mother. My, my son's birth mother chose us the same week that my grandmother was supposed to move in. So I got a four week old baby and a 99 year old in the same weekend. It was, it was like, okay, Lord, you didn't ask me about how much I can bear, but I'm glad you didn't because I wouldn't have signed up for this. But he, you know, gave us, he was so much grace and it was such a wonderful time that I was with, able to spend with my grandmother and being able to have those close grown up conversations with her. She knew she was in the midst of her transition and she was like, she welcomed it with oh, more than open arms. She was like, I'm ready to go. Jesus can call me tonight and I'm ready. And, and I would ask her if, if she felt like there was anything left for her to do. Did she accomplish everything that she was you know, meant to accomplish? And she was like, no, I've done everything that the Lord has asked me to do. I'm ready whenever he is. And I had the whole idea of puff cuff in my mind. You know, like I said, I had talked myself out of it for whatever insecurities and that I had. But with that, I was like, okay, if I am blessed to live 
as long as she has, will I be regretful to not do anything with this idea? With that thought, it was like no turning back. So that's when I actually took my first full-time job since, since college, again, was to work to be able to get the money to bring Puff Cuff to life. So that was literally, that was the aha moment. I want people to understand uh, that are listening or watching uh, the experience of your product. So what are your customers saying about using the Puff Cuff? My customers are the reason why I do this, honest, that point blank. And I did not realize the significance that Puff Cuff, we call it a life changer, a lifesaver. And it really, and, and that really comes from my, my customers. So let me, let me show you how it works. First of all, I'm wearing two of them right now. So we have them in five different sizes, but my, since I started getting micro locks, my hair is much, much thicker. So I use the, the biggest one, which is this one right here, even though this is the puff cuff, even though it's shaped in the, in the package, it looks like it's more oval shaped. It's not, it's actually round. So it, it's like this. So the way it works is take off the bigger wood too. This is it here. So you open it wide, okay? Then you gather your hair wherever you want your puff or ponytail to be. And because now my hair is thicker at the scalp, that's why I use the bigger one. But you put one arm in, then you bring the other arm around and you overlap the hooks and then you let your hair go. So the right. way that it works different than anything else, first of all, everything else on the market literally is designed for straight hair. It's to give, it's to bind thin or straight hair, thin strands together to give it bulk. Well, it kind of, and I can kind of compare it to like fiber optics, you know, when you, you saw the fiber optics, that's kind of like uh, how it used to be those, those, thin, thin strands, they wrap it in, in plastic or rubber or whatever to give it, to hold it and bind it together. Well, us that have curls and texture, our hair already has bulk. So we don't need anything to bind it. We just need something to hold it in place. So then the other, I'll put in my second puff cuff, which is a junior. So then it gives me height because my hair is so much longer now than it used to be. So, but the whole thing is because it's not binding and cinching, it's just holding the hair pl in place. You don't get the headache and you don't get the hair damage. Like I sleep in my puff cuff every night. So what has been some of your tactics to really help people understand or simply just educate them about your business? I lean on my customers, to be honest. I have had customers, I was just on an investor call the other day where we were running, we ran a, a crowdfunding campaign and with crowdfunding, you know, the ever average everyday person can invest in the company. And I held an investor call, the whole premise, and I learned this from um, Curl Mix, from Kim, Kim Lewis of Curl Mix, um, that as black people, the majority of us have never invested in any, any, any anything, especially after of a certain age, we've never, invested our money into a business or a vehicle that can make us money outside of our 401k or whatever, you know, comes with the job or whatever. But the reason why Puff Cuff has had the success that it has is because of people that look like me that are trusting and buying the product. So why not offer them the opportunity to invest? So when Puff Cuff does, you know, see its ultimate success, that everybody can win and everybody can benefit from it. So, like I said, I was on the investor call and it was an it was an open forum for anyone to ask whatever questions. And one this actually a husband and wife team, um, I should say team, husband and wife were on the call, and the wife just, you know, I figured she had natural hair and she I figured she just wanted to ask more of a um, a question about the return on the investment and this, that, and the other. And she was like, I really just want you to know that I, I bought your puff cuff 
And I bought it because I started suffering from alopecia and all of my hair fell out. But when it started to grow back, I was so afraid of all the other tools that were out there that they were going to damage this new hair that I had so desperately prayed for to grow back. And she said, I ran across the puff cuff and she was like, and I'm actually wearing it right now. And I could see her husband in the background shaking his head, you know, shaking his head in agreement and acknowledgement that this was a tough time in her house and her self-esteem. And, you know, when mom ain't right, the whole rest of the house ain't right. <laughs> and, and our hair, point blank, our hair is part of our essence and who we are. And she was like, and I'm trying not to get emotional, but she started to get emotional. She was like, you just don't know that I had prayed for a tool to help me with this new season that I was in of really understanding and understanding in my hair and the value of my hair. Because sometimes we take it for granted until you lose it, right? Then it was like, but I need, I, she's like, I know, I knew I needed a tool that, cause I was not going to go back to the relaxers. I didn't want to do a wig. I didn't want to do you know, all the other things that could possibly damage my hair again. And she said, I prayed for a tool and puff cuff was that tool for her. And I just was like, and I've had so many other instances like that, but that it's literally like, you know what, this tool helped me, help me um, mend the relationship with my mother, like, because I'm of mixed race or my mother had straight hair and she didn't know what to do with my hair. And from then it always was a wedge in our relationship. But this, this tool helped me um, embrace my hair and embrace my look and realize that my hair wasn't bad. It was something, it was other stuff that played into the reason why I felt this way about my hair. This helped me be comfortable in my own skin. And it's when I hear, when I see a, a little brown girl um, put the puff cuff in her braids for the week, uh, for the summer, and she can wear now her, you know, her ponytail and have her braids up and not, and she's like, and it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. And that it's stuff like that 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 makes all of this worth it. It, it hands down have you seen any people try to copy your idea from the beginning and that's another reason why i say you have to really understand and do your do your research about the things that are actually obvious there's a reason why beauty supply stores are korean owned and they're in black neighborhoods there's a reason for that. There's a reason behind that. And I can tell you, there was a bill that it was introduced years and years ago, years and years ago. And uh, this is why the dollars that we spend on personal care items fuel a global economy. And I don't think we realize that. We literally are supporting a whole other country through our dollars. But there was a bill, like I said, there was a bill that was passed before you and I were born. I know I'm older than you, but before I was born, probably even before my mama was born, where human hair can never be harvested within the United States. It always would have to come. It was, a, it was, a, it was an agreement with Korea. What race of people can you convince that their hair is not good? That, that money is already taken out of so that automatically fuels that country's economy. For the hair, you gotta have products, right? You gotta have a place to sell it, right? You gotta have everything. They bought a lot of the black companies. They bought up all the distribution rights. They go into lower income black neighborhoods, buy the real estate, only hire their family. They own the whole freaking supply chain. And then they lock out other businesses, and at least prior to, they would lock out other businesses, um, especially black businesses, because they own all the distribution channels. So it was hard for black 
beauty supplies to stay in business in their own neighborhood. They've got it on lock from top to bottom. So with saying that, that's who was knocking me off. Now I do have two patents. I have actually four patents, but I have two patents on the puff cuff. And then I have another patent on another version of the puff cuff. And then I have a patent on my edge tool that I invented because uh, my edge tool is a real plug, low plug. It's the same as every other edge tool, but my bristles are made out of silicone instead of bore because our the our edges are delicate. So the bore tends to put more tension and stress where the silicone does not. And plus you can rinse the silicone out so you can rinse all that disgusting gel out of it under the sink. But the Korean shopper, there was actually, he made a mold of my product and started selling it, calling it the puff clamp in on the east coast and it was my fans that let me know that this was happening so what i say even though i have a patent there's no patent police it's still up to you to protect your patent and typically these um, um distributors have deep deep pockets because again they have been fueled on the owners of these distribution companies have been fueled on the dollar of black and brown people for years, 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 years. So even though I tried to fight it, I, it, it, I just couldn't afford to fight it anymore. And then it came down to, okay, I've got to beat them with the story and the brand, just like Nike, Nike and, and Gucci and, and, and Fenty and all, it's all about the brand recognition and the customer loyalty. So I don't have that large of explore, but you know, and, and I'm saying that because all of them are being knocked off, but it's about what the customer values in buying what they know is real versus what's not. So let me ask you this, uh, what's the future for the Puff Cuff? Um, are you looking to partner with the larger business or are you simply, you know, looking to keep the business within the family? Kind of talk us through what the future looks like for you. Risha Lou Dennis has done with Shea Moisture, Monique Rodriguez, what she's done with Myel, what B. Dixon has done with Honey Pot, with I forget the name of a, um, a Carol's daughter, the founder. I can see her face right there, but I'm having that senior moment. But um, the only, the way that they have figured out the formula to be able to not just be the last, but to be, put this on repeat for other brands and other people that look like us that have been um, locked out of the opportunity for one reason or, an, or another of history of a certain level of generational wealth that's that's my goal. So my goal right now is to build the brand because Puff Cuff is a global brand. 65% of the world's population has curly or textured hair. And everybody, all of that can use more than one Puff Cuff. And but a lot of it, they just don't know the solution exists. That Puff Cuff, they know they have the problem, but they don't know that there's a solution. And curly hair comes across all ethnicities. It's not necessarily just for uh, people of African descent. And um, more now than every years before, people are embracing their texture and growing out their hair um, globally. So I 100%, 2000% know that Puff Cuff can be a global brand. It's a matter of the exposure the opportunity, the access, and the funding. And if I can get those things in line, and that's what I'm actively working toward, working on to get towards the, to that goal, I want to get the the company at the place where someone, um, some partner, corporation, whatever, sees the value of it is and is able to take it to the point where it, 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 sh it deserves to be. Am I passing it on to my children? Heck, you know, mm -mm. 
my destiny is not necessarily their destiny, you know? Right. But I do want my children, their children, their children's children all to be able to have the that 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 opportunity to make that decision based on what I was able to build on what they want to do and what they don't, you know, what opportunities they want to take on. But my whole mission literally is to be that person that I didn't have when I started this business for other people and not have to worry about where my bills, my bills are being paid and that I can fuel and fund those people who have that burning passion and you know that they, they actually, they have something, they have that idea, they can, they can take it to this next level, but they just don't know how to do it. And I, I'm still learning myself, but it's one of those each one help one. That's where I'm at. All right. So what final advice or thoughts would you like to share with the audience? And before you go, make sure to shout out your website um, so people can purchase your product. <laughs> um, also, uh, let people know how to reach you on social media um, and just really appreciate your time. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would I always say that one of the things that you have to realize is and, and, and embrace is that you don't know everything and um, don't be afraid to admit what you don't know. There are genuine people out there that will help you through, but if you work in that silo of I can do it all and I've got to be in control of it all, you're just going to spin in a circle. You're not going to grow. And the whole point of it is to grow. The other point, the other thing I have to say is this is not for the week. Entrepreneurship, small business is not for the weak at all. It takes a lot. And there's, there are some, there may be more, you know, seasons of peaks and valleys. But if you stay in, if you stay in the game, it, it, it will pay off. But it is one thing. And I think social media and, and, and regular media, media have made it have like romanticized small business and glorified small business. And they think that, you know, I can have one post and it just takes off and you know, I'll be set for the rest of my, that's not how it works. People's attention span is so short right now that you'll be up here one day. And then the next, next year you'll be like, do y'all remember when such and such and such? So it's about, it's about that, you know, being in it for the long game and, uh, Creating a good plan, definitely creating a good plan, but also knowing you're not out here by yourself, but you, if you become an island, island of one, you're doing yourself a disservice, a huge disservice, but you can find us at the puffcuff.com. When you asked me about those, uh, the, the copycats and the knockoffs, I forgot to tell you that I actually did knock myself off because I couldn't compete. I was like, I can't compete with those, that the money that's driving those machines, but I can create a better mousetrap, is that what they, what they say? So um, there is a big uh, brand in the black hair care space that I mentioned earlier that is not black owned, that put a clip on the market that's very much like mine, put it this way, it's still on the market, but this is my version of it. It was like the heavens opened up and the light was shining down. It was like, that makes so much sense. So I have the cuff it line and this is the, the budget line of the puff cuff. The puff cuff is a premium product, but we have a budget line. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, right. Yes, we have a budget line and the budget line is actually um, available in HEB stores in Texas. And it's about to roll out into 1700, not 1700, 1500 CVS stores. Um, it's also available on Amazon and it's available on walmart.com. And I've got a couple other retailers that are interested in it, but it's all right now. It's about, you know, owning my space in the tool aisle. And I'm the only black one doing it. 
in a tool that is not elastic. So Our I'm social. on every social channel uh, that is out there and it's always at the Puff Cuff. So T-H-E-P-U-F-F-C-U-F-F. And I'll make sure to include all your contact information in the show notes. So again, thank you so much for joining the show. You gave us a wealth of information when it comes to the personal care industry, entrepreneurship as a whole, and just simply going for yours as an entrepreneur. So I just really uh, admire that about you. So good luck to you, your family, and your business. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. You take care. I really appreciate the allowing me on this platform and to bring additional exposure to the brand and other small businesses, you know, that are in the same game, just trying to trying to do what we do for the customers that we know that we fulfill a need for.